Welcome to a Legendarium episode about Julian the Apostate, Rome's last pagan emperor. In this episode, we will learn about the man who tried and failed miserably to restore paganism to Christian Rome. In 312, Constantine had a vision of a cross burning in the sky before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. He supposedly saw the words, In this sign you will conquer in the sky, and ordered his soldiers to inscribe their shields with Kai Rho, the Greek initials for the name of Jesus Christ. The story passed into legend, and Rome's imperial family became Christian. From Constantine I onward, all Roman emperors had been part of the church, and Constantine's successful rule solidified the new faith. Within a generation, Christianity went from being the faith of one in ten Romans to one in five. However, one of Constantine's nephews would challenge that. Young Julian was born a generation after Milvian Bridge, around the year 332. His father, Julius Constantius, served as prefect of the Praetorian Guard. Julian grew up in a harsh environment that tested his nerve from a young age. While many people admire Constantine for his reign, his family's struggle for the throne after Constantine's death turned very bloody very fast. In 337, when Julian was five years old, his cousin and the third son of Constantine I became emperor in the east as Constantius II. The army wanted none but a son of Constantine I as his successor, and set about murdering possible rivals to the sacred line. Constantius II murdered Julian's father in 337 and Julian's elder brother in 341. His mother Basilina died soon after, leaving Julian an orphan by the age of nine. His surviving half-brother Gallus grew up in obscurity, and Julian himself grew up as a prisoner in Roman Cappadocia under the watchful eye of a Christian bishop. Julian's only friend became a household slave named Mardonius, who served as a father figure to Julian and probably drew him towards classical learning. Though Julian's family brought him up as a Christian, baptized him, and ordained him as a leader in the church, he traveled to Greece to learn philosophy and spent his formative years studying under unreformed Greek pagans. Since Emperor Constantius II killed off most of his male family members, he had to choose Julian and his brother Gallus as co-emperors in the West once they came of age. By then, Julian grew into a handsome man with broad shoulders, an athletic build, and intense eyes. However, he also became noted for being socially awkward and holding his head at an odd angle. Nonetheless, he joined his half-brother Gallus on the journey to the capital. Sadly, Gallus died during the year 355 during his journey, so Julian became the only co-emperor to Constantius II. He arrived in the capital still wearing his student gown, and his bloody kinsman Constantius II learned that Julian would be his only co-emperor. Constantius II provided Julian with a wife named Helena. Of course, if Constantius II knew that Julian hated him for murdering his family and had secretly become a pagan in Greece, then the emperor would have stopped the appointment. Julian spent his early years in Gaul, retaking lost Roman lands in victories remarkable for a young man with no military experience. His career took a sudden turn when the Gallic troops mutinied rather than marched to new stations in the east. The mutineers made Julian their new emperor, and we do not know for sure if Julian just went along with the mutiny or was forced into it at sword point. Regardless, the civil war ended quickly when death retired Constantius II from politics. After presiding over the Christian funeral of Constantius II, Julian immediately revealed his true faith to the public, shocking his fellow Christians, even more so because by Julian's time more than half the Roman Empire had become Christian. 
To restore Roman paganism and undo his family's work, Julian allowed heretical bishops to return and split the church between the Orthodox and heretics. Having become a skilled debater during his youth, Julian wrote against Christ's teachings, especially Christ's preaching of forgiveness. Julian argued that Christianity only attracted people with no interest in self-improvement, but wanted to be absolved from wrongdoing simply by asking for it, which struck him as lazy. Julian also passed a law that banned Christians from teaching, reasoning that Christian teachers would not use beloved classical texts like Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Most incredibly, Julian rebuilt the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, hardly a benevolent act to Roman Jews. Christ had foretold the destruction of the temple, which occurred in 70 AD, decades after Christ's crucifixion. By rebuilding it, Julian hoped to prove that Jesus had been wrong. And to counter the strong moral philosophy laid out by Christian leaders, Julian ordered one of his friends to write an alternative. They turned to Neoplatonism, a school of thought that tried to bring together the many different strains of classical thought into one tradition. But with so many pagan traditions, this proved a difficult task. Julian also cracked down on bad behavior among the remaining pagan priests, ordering them to stay away from taverns and brothels. He also urged them to perform acts of charity like Christian priests did. After taking sole power in Rome, Julian dismissed most of his staff and did away with elaborate court ceremonies, like having visitors kiss the hem of the emperor's robe. When Julian's wife died, he chose to live as a celibate and practiced extreme plainness in his life, eating brown bread and drinking sour wine. Julian spent most of his reign in Antioch, which had a large Christian population who hated the apostate. When Julian ordered a Christian martyr buried in a sacred grove of Daphne dug up, he sparked riots between Christians and pagans. This led to several Christian deaths and more martyrs for the church, which Julian knew to be devastating to his cause. In any case, Julian could not only devote himself to religious matters. Many previous emperors tried before to invade Persia in hopes of gaining wealth and glory, motivated by a desire for the latter two and a wish to reassert Rome's power in the east, Julian assembled an army of 65,000 men backed by a river fleet. This became the largest army ever to campaign in Persia, and Julian marched despite desperate calls for prudence from his own council. Those cautious men proved right. The Persians, aided by the desert, famine, Treachery and Roman incompetence proved themselves the better men. During a disastrous retreat from the walls of Cestaphon below modern-day Baghdad, Julian suffered a wound from a spear thrown by an unknown man. Could it have been a Persian or even an angry Roman Christian? Julian became the last pagan emperor when he died the next night at age 31, having been emperor for 20 months. The Roman ruling class never really abandoned Christianity, so why did Christianity prevail despite Julian the Apostate? It had a strong philosophy laid out in sacred writings, while paganism did not. Late Roman leaders saw Christianity as a virtuous philosophy compared to the might-makes-right teachings of paganism. Bishops could easily portray their faith as moral progress from the old ways. Christian writers trashed Julian's reputation after his death, painting him as a weird and nervous man who martyred Christian saints. Given the advantages Christianity enjoyed, including support from most of the imperial family, Julian's failure seems inevitable. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.